Today is Monday the 29th of August and I'm speaking at the Athens Regional Library boardroom with Mr. Dr. Sorry, Dr. John F. Stegeman and Dr. Goodlow Irwin. And right now, since the microphone is on Dr. Stegeman, um, I'd like to ask you what the F in your name stands for, sir. Foster. John Foster Stegeman. Dr. Stegeman, um, could you, I, I often ask to begin the interviews by talking about your experiences during the World War II era, but Dr. Irwin has just clued me into the fact that you were both in medical school together. Right. So I'd like you to begin wherever you like and uh, tell me a little bit about um, your experiences, sir. Well, we were in medical school at the time of the war, and when it was about half over at the, at the height, the U.S. government decided to subsidize all the medical students in the country. And we all went into a, a training program uh, at our various various medical schools and uh, actually was sworn in as private, but privates in the uh, Army of the United States. But we were able to continue our uh, studies at the, uh, with the federal government paying the bill. We had books, tuition, subsistence, uniforms, and the salary of a private. <laughs> and so it was a great boon to us to go in, so we, we were not at all sorry to get drafted into the Army. We were immune from the regular draft, so we were able to complete our education in the service, then take an internship and a residency, and then go back. Uh, then, then we were obligated to go into the Army or the Navy, if they called us. So you were, were you from Africa before you yeah. went to medical school? Right. This is my home since I was 10 months old. <laughs> And how old were you when you went to medical school? 21. We went, we entered in 1940, so it was just before the war started. And I mentioned to Mrs. Stevens that we were just sitting there in the living room. It was a Sunday, and uh, just having a little talk, kind of drowsing off a little bit. We heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Somebody heard it on the radio. And so they yelled it down to us that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And my, one of our good of my roommates, Charlie Holman, said, where in the hell is Pearl Harbor? He said, it must not be very important. And he went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that was, so you and Dr. Irwin were actually roommates with another? There were two. There were three of us, Goodlow and myself and Charlie Holman. And we had two rooms between, for the three of us. And we were right there together for the first, first year of then uh, we separated a... Uh, in 1941, we were, you got married, didn't you? And when, yeah, in 42. You get, you get married in 41 or 42? 42. When did you get married? In June of 42. I, we got oh. married early in March of 42. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still in med school. as a sophomore year. Right. Yeah. Did you stay in medical school after your marriage? Yeah. We married when I was a sophomore and we stayed in uh, the ASTP program training program I was telling you about and uh, then went into an internship and a residency and uh, that's sort of when I lost sight of Goodloe because he, he went overseas and I didn't. We, <clears throat> we fought the battles of Texas and Massachusetts and Virginia. Changed residences ten times during the war years. Um, so you've um told me where you were when, when Pearl Harbor was, but I, I'm, where were you in medical school? Would you remind me? Emory. At Emory. In Lansbury, yeah. And uh, what kind of a campus was Emory at that time? It was a beautiful wooded campus, very quiet and peaceful. Not like it is now. <laughs> it's like a little city now, driving through there. I go to one of the doctors over in the clinic there, and it's, it's a real experience getting a parking place and <laughs> getting into that clinic. Um, and you were married in 1942? Right. How did you meet your wife? Well, <laughs> my, wife, my wife's mother and father and my mother and father were all 
good friends. They all went to the University of Chicago, and her parents married before mine, and a year later, well, my parents married. But uh, they were sort of Janet, my wife, of course, was the child of Mr. and Mrs. L.A., which is Janet's maiden name. And I uh, forgot where I was. <laughs> you for a little detail about perhaps how you met and uh, yeah well really can't even say when I first met her because we sort of grew up together. yeah uh, so if you were newlywed during wartime and moving around quite a bit can you fill in some of the blanks on tell some of those spots you must have moved to well we started out as ordered to Boston and the Cape Cod uh, for a U.S. Uh, hospital at Cape, Cape Cod near Falmouth, Massachusetts. And then we moved down to Texas at uh, San Antonio, stayed at two or three different residences down there. And then we went back up to Massachusetts and then to Virginia, Fort Lee, Virginia. I was 40. So you said you stayed in the service in Virginia until 1947? Yeah. Was it a medical unit of, of some? Well, there is an Embry Medical Unit, but we weren't in that. This was just, we were just on our own then, and we were subject to Uncle Sam's orders. And so uh, we went on, on into the, as first lieutenants in the medical corps, and then uh, got up to captains. How, how high did you get, Goodlow? I discharged a first lieutenant. Uh -huh. <laughs> Caught him up. <laughs> Well, um, um, it's an awfully long span of time and an awful lot of changes. Um, um, I'm sure there's a lot of detail. Um, was there one place you liked better than another? One post or one one? You know, we were we were so uh, glad to get get some place where we could make a little money. We felt like rich people just as a first lieutenant's salary or a captain's salary. And uh, we were, we were just. The war was over when I got in the in the service, and so there was no particular danger involved either way. But uh, it's just one of those. It's awful hard to say where we enjoyed the most. We enjoyed San Antonio and the climate down there, except in the summertime, which was just great. And uh, I really think the proudest I ever was was when we went into that training program that Goodall was talking about. And I was talking about as first as uh, privates, and so they gave us just a private's uniform. We finally got made, made private first class. Twenty-one dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> but we felt like I mean, for a resident at that time, assistant resident at Grady Hospital, I made thirty-five dollars a month. So we well, were uh, well, in the internship. We, we, our pay was cut when we got out of the training program. We, our pay dropped from twenty-one to eleven dollars a month. That's what an intern was paid at Grady Hospital. Before taxes. Yeah. <laughs> so we lost money when we got out of that PFC STP program. We, we dropped our course. When we went in, they paid our tuition, room, board, and $21 a month. And that was, we were living high then on $21 a month and had all our expenses taken care of. John, tell them a little bit about how we were inducted into the Army. You remember? Yeah. we. It was July of 1943, which was right at the height of the war, and uh, we, we were sworn in. We were the first class to be sworn in, but all over the country where the medical students was, were uh, sworn in to the Army, the training program. And I remember that we went, they took us, <coughs> took us out to, well, first we went to the campus of Emory. I think the name of the uh, building was the Fishman Building there in the corner of Clifton Way in North Decatur. It had us all out there trying to form a straight line, and the line was just weaving in and out. Wasn't a, wasn't a person there that ever known anything about marching or staying in line, <laughs> except a few maybe ROTC students. I, I was one of them. I had already had a reserve commission. Oh, you already had one, didn't you? Go ahead. Yeah. But uh, we were all lined up there in the I remember thinking how pale and white we all looked compared to the regular army officers, the recruiting officers that came in all tanned and 
Burley, and we've been sitting around in laboratories and working in other labs and uh, microscopic work and that kind of thing. We had to keep the lights down low, and nobody had a sunburn at all. We're all just ghostly white. <laughs> I remember, remember the, remember feeling sorry for ourselves. We looked so bad. We didn't know we looked so bad. <laughs> we saw each other out there lined up, but you can't imagine a possibly a more disorganized gang of would-be soldiers than we were at that time. They took us out to Fort McPherson. That's where we were actually sworn in near Atlanta there. And uh, went through the two, how long were we there? Good old, two or three oh, days? About almost a week. A week? Like five days maybe. And that gave us all kinds of menial tasks and the, the old stereotyped sergeant was fussing at us the whole time talking through the intercom. <laughs> Our roommate our other roommate, Charlie Holman, gave the sergeant so much trouble that the sergeant kept giving him these little menial tasks out there at the, the barracks. And one time they told him that he had to wash all the windows in, this, in our barracks. And uh, an hour later I walked by and he was still on the same window, in the corner of a handkerchief, he was wiping the window off. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys saw a lot of each other as you joined up? Well, actually we went, we did then because we still had two more years, I mean still had six more months of, uh, in, of uh, medical school and then we had to, an internship of nine months and then a residency of nine months. And I had another one after that, a nine months, that was to escape the war. The war was over by the time I got in. Was there anything you were particularly afraid of? No, I don't think so. At that, that time we were, as Goodloe said, we, were, we felt rich. We were, we were making good money, not having to work too hard, and weren't exposed to any bu bullets. <laughs> so we were, we thought we were in hog heaven. And we were compared to the way we had to live at Grady Hospital. <laughs> well, uh, can you describe for me how it felt to have the war come to an end? Do you remember uh, VE Day? Yeah, VJ Day, Day, Day. Some of those <clears throat> sure do. August 13th, yeah. 1945. Lillian Winship and I went, went on a tear that night. Lillian was in town, and uh, she came out and ate supper with us. He was, was still in the, you were still at Grady at that time, weren't you? Yeah, still at Grady. And uh, we had supper there at Grady Hospital. They always, they gave us what we call tops and bottoms. The tops of the turnips and the bottoms. <laughs> 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 the greens and the turnips. And the boiled eggs, hard boiled eggs. That was our menu day after day. <laughs> In that part of the world. Yeah, we just had a howling time that night because the, the word passed around. We knew that the surrender had actually taken place and everybody just, just had a tremendous night of it. Night and dawn, practically. They were still dancing in the streets. I remember very well. Um, and you, were, you, you still were um, in the service? Uh, for another two years? Well, actually, what happened, see, we, we, go ahead, good luck. When we graduated from med school, we finished the ASTP program. That was just under med, undergraduate, so we were discharged from the Army and given reserve commissions when we graduated in December of 1943, so then we were out of the Army until we went back on active duty. I went I'm back on active duty in nine months, but he he had 27 months of training in Grady, and uh, he went on active duty, what, October 45? Well, actually it, was, actually, it was January 46, I think. January 46. So I, I went on active duty in October 1944. So that's, we were in med school together in, in that specialized training program for our, lab, for our senior part of the, the senior year when that we got our, our, we were, got free tuition care of the government. No reason to put us in that, but, but some strange people up in Washington decided that's <laughs> what uh, everybody, they, I think they wanted to tie, they didn't know the war was going to be over so soon and they wanted to obligate all these medical people so that they would could call them up and call them to, to do this, so they wanted to have those 
and the same with it. This is Army Specialized Training Program was they had engineering students. It was all over the United States. They had these people in specialty training, and uh, but we were discharged from that when we graduated, and we were all given a commission in the medical corps in the reserve. We had to put on our civilian clothes again, though. I remember that was kind of tough, tough doing after we'd been around with, in our uniforms and had to take them off. We looked like draft dodgers. <laughs> Excuse me, good though. So we, we Dr. Were, Irwin, let yeah. me pin the microphone right. on you just for a little bit right. because just I can, I, I may do the, the microphone this way for right. a bit. So you right. both, but I want to hear your own voice. But, um, you were telling me about that program. And, uh, well, I'll tell you about my military career because I had a long military career. The first, I, I took advanced ROTC at the university in the cavalry. And uh, in 1939, the summer of 1939, I went to the advanced camp up at Fort Overthorpe where we all the senior ROTC students, students in the cavalry went to camp and we were up there six weeks for advanced training and it was all on horses. This is 1939 and of course that was the time just in the September day I think of 1939 was when Hitler invaded Poland and I was up at Tate. At, John was lifeguard at Tate, and I did, we both did lifeguard work. I did at Athens Y Camp, and I relieved John for a week of the summer. And I was, I remember very clearly, I was up at Tate at that time when the war actually started with the invasion of Poland, and, and the German tanks were running all over Poland, and here we had been training in, on horses just like the Poles were trying to combat the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> with our horse cavalry. That was the best. <laughs> <laughs> decimated. Yeah. That was the last but year. that's how poorly prepared the United States was. They didn't have, have enough any tanks to train the cavalry. Or very, I don't know if any reserve officers got tank training. Then and when I went in, I, in 1940 when I graduated, another point of interest, uh, I couldn't get a commission because I was only 20. And you had to be 21 to get a commission. And then when I did get a commission, and I was put in the Calvary Reserve, but then I, in medical school, they changed me to the Medical Administrative Corps. And so, horsemen good luck. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that's the reason I went to Calvary. I enjoyed horses. I wouldn't <laughs> have done it otherwise. That was what, what I enjoyed, was riding in your neighbor. W.C. Causey, yeah. he, he was in the cavalry with him, and, and uh, he and I won a contest at Thought to contest to see who the best horseman won, and we tied it first, and then we had a jump off. You and Bill? Bill and myself, and <laughs> this was jump jumping contest. With and I won his horse, <laughs> knocked off something before mine did. So <laughs> the uh, so I I was changed to the medical administrative course, so I would not be called up to active duty when the war started. Cause and, uh, and then when we joined the ASTP, I was reduced from a first lieutenant to a PFC. <laughs> but then we got nine months free education now. I was senior year in med school and then we, in, in graduation, and we were all given a commission in the reserve, so I was, a, we were all given first lieutenant's commission. And I only served nine months at Grady Hospital, but really, we really served more than that, John, because when we, when we interns, they put us on. Oh, we were still Same medical students. Student. They, they had taken so many interns, cut the interns so they could cause the getting doctors in the service. We only had half the regular number of interns at Grady Hospital. So they 
as soon as they decided we were going to intern at Grady, we went, moved into Grady Hospital and acted as interns for our senior medical students. So I think we had about six months of that and nine months yeah. of the regular, and that was the hardest work I've ever done in my life. Was that that year at Grady Hospital? Have you ever done any work compared to that? That that was we would work. I think we had one afternoon and two nights off a week. Other than that, we were on. Or five nights a week. Five nights a week, we were on call 24 hours a day. We we would average 16 hours a day, and with frequent interruptions in the middle of the night, getting up at night to see about people. And that was that year. I did twice as much work as I did the two years I was in the service. It was. Where did you live? I lived in the hospital. You lived in Grady Hospital because you were on call. You had to be there. And they were so short of interns and residents that they. <clears throat> that was, that was, and I was just glad to get in the service to get. I, I was ex exhausted. He went into pediatrics when he didn't work quite as hard after. after but no, I, I, had, I had it easy. I went on uh, active duty in 19. Uh, October of 1944, and we went, I don't know where the, the, yes, the, the, this Yes, hold it angled. Okay. <laughs> yep, actually, I'm going to zoom in on it. I went up to Vaughan General Hospital. Okay. I'm, I'm rolling now on the August, and, and I'm speaking with Dr. <laughs> Goodlow Irwin and Dr. John Stegman, and can you tell me about these photographs? Well, this is my original order to active duty, and I went to Vaughan General Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, for six weeks before I went to the medical field service school at Carlisle Barracks for six weeks. And every medical officer had to go through medical field service school. I went through the same basic training I had in high school ROTC, university ROTC, ASTP. <laughs> I <laughs> started <laughs> about the fifth time I went through the same course of basic training, <laughs> map reading, close order drill, and so forth, on <laughs> <laughs> hygiene. <laughs> and uh, we, I was up there in December. I remember the the big event was a two foot snow we had, and it was this. The day before, we were supposed to take a 20-mile hike, and they canceled the hike, so <laughs> that was a, at the time. And then they, they had a train that pulled out of Carlisle. I guess there must have been cars full of all the doctors that were finishing their training there at Carlisle Barracks, and uh, several hundred of us. And the <clears throat> New Year's Eve, we were on the train from Harrisburg to Chicago to St. Louis. And we left early in the morning, I think, of New Year's Eve. And in Chicago, we took the train from Chicago to St. Louis. And I remember that because we were a group of us uh, met some co-eds who were going to the University of Oklahoma and <laughs> we parted saying Rum and Coca-Cola was the song. <laughs> and we parted for all the way from Chicago to St. Louis. A group of us went on down to the service command in Dallas and, the, and well, I was received these orders to go to Count Walters, Texas. And there were three of us friends Dr. John Elder, who practiced medicine here for years, was assigned to Camp Walters, and Dr. Mac Reynolds, another good friend, <clears throat> who had gone to the University Medical School, and we were <clears throat> assigned to Camp Walters, and I was stationed there for a year. And I was assigned to the medical service. It was a thousand-bed hospital, and I was doing just what I was trained to do, and since I'd had a straight medical internship at Grady Hospital, the chief of medicine kind of used me as his right-hand man, and he would put me where the problems were. And during the early January, February, I've had a lot of meningitis, strep throat, tonsillitis, infectious diseases, and I was on the infectious disease ward. 
and then the uh, spraying came, all these, there's a relationship between infectious disease and rheumatic fever, and we got a bunch of cases of rheumatic fever, so Dr. Smith put me on the rheumatic fever ward for the next two months, and the summer came along, and we had heat stroke and heat exhaustion, so he put me in charge of the heat, <laughs> that ward, and we, it, it was a very serious thing. We had a lot of soldiers came in with heat stroke. That's temperature 106 to 110, and we put them in a tub of ice, try to get the temperature down, give them supportive treatment. And about we had about 15 cases, and I think about seven of them died in spite of the treatment. It was Camp Walters is near Fort Worth, and temperatures would get up to 110. This was an infantry training camp. They had 30 to 40,000 troops there going through basic training. <clears throat> and uh, so I, it was a pleasant time. It was a 40-hour week, more or less. We'd pull night duty maybe once every two weeks. Otherwise, you were free to socialize. We had all kind of we had a horseback ride, and you could play golf, tennis, swimming, and there are all these nurses, young nurses, that had to be entertained, and so it was re really the the most fun I've ever had in my life was the two years I had now. I, I, I did things that I enjoyed doing, and I had a first time I was making them any money so that I I was able to buy a car and have fun and enjoy life for the first time in my life. And <clears throat> so uh, after a year there, the war was over, and uh, they closed the Camp Walters, and I went around to a couple other posts before I was sent overseas. They, they, in February, I think they had sent home most every doctor in Europe, and we were, I think, a thousand doctors. We started out at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and then went to Camp Kilmer. And then we <clears throat> got on this real nice ship. It was called the George Washington. It was a ship that was taken from the Germans in World War II, and it was a luxury line at that days, but it was still a real good ship, and we, we shipped overseas on that ship, and it was a real nice voyage. The ship, uh, we, we were in the North Atlantic in uh, February and March, February, and the seas were pretty heavy, but it was a pleasant voyage compared to what a lot of people did. We, we were in, I think, six, eight, bunks people into a cabin. I had an interesting roommate, Henry Clay Frick. He was a descendant of the Henry, the Henry, the Henry Clay Frick. It was, I think, Alexander Mellon's uh, oh. associate with the steel mills and the Pennsylvania Railroad and whatnot. Multimillionaire. <laughs> Real nice fellow. He was an obstetrician, I think. Anyway, we, we ended up this is a letter, a nice letter I got on August the 2nd, 1945, from a German prisoner of war. There was a German prisoner of war camp, there, an Italian prisoner of war camp, thanking me for nice treatment that he got. And I, we were. Now, uh, we ended up in Camp Lucky Strike in La Havre, Germany, and uh, which was the coldest night I've ever had in my life. It was about the first of March, and we were in little pup tents, and the uh, wind was coming off right on the English Channel on a high bluff above the channel. It was just about 30 degrees. <laughs> We were there about three days, and then we took a slow train through the northern France to Marburg, Germany, which is an old university town. And we stayed there for about a week. And then I got orders to uh, go to the Garmisch Recreation Center in southern Germany. 
And let's see if I've got any pictures. Then this is, I was assigned as general medical officer and manager of the Schnaefener House Hotel. The Schnaefener House Hotel was on the Sugspitzer Mountain, which is the tallest mountain in Germany. It's where the Winter Olympics were held in 1936 when Germany had the Olympics. And this was the view out of my hotel window. Mm. Looked out over the Alps. It was a 9,000 foot elevation. And it was, this was on a cloudy day. And it was a little, really a, a little glacier. There were no trees. It was an open slope skin. And I had to learn to ski because I was supposed to take care of the broken legs. Is this a Garmisch? This is a Garmisch. You met a girl named Pat over there. Yeah, I, I met a young lady there. But uh, within a week, I was on skis and going out to uh, put splints on the broken legs. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's what my job was. I'd never seen a pair of skis. Uh, this was a picture of the Zugspitzer Mountains, the, the Butterstein and Garmisch. And it was the third army ski school that I was assigned to. And I went up there the, in March of uh, 1946. And the, my job was to run the hotel, which I'd never done, and take care of the injuries to the skiers, which I'd never done. But it was... Uh, and after two months, they closed the ski school, and I was continued to be stationed there until September. And we had people come up to ski, but there was really very few, nothing to do. And that's where I met my wife. She was uh, doing Army Special Service recreation work, and uh, she was stationed there also. Well, is that the... Uh Letter that you got from the German prison. Is that in there? Mm -hmm. Did you read that? Was it in German? No. Let's see. Dear sir, when I do leave this hospital, I feel obliged to say separately, you, my hearty thanks for your careful and thorough attendance. I thank also Sir Colonel Smith, Captain Shapiro, the good nurses, and all the medical personnel for their untiring work in trouble. Walter Perschel, German prisoner of war. That's good. I had a prisoner of war camp. Uh, I was a medical officer in, in uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I didn't get a letter like that. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't like each other too well. Well, the, the, both the, the Italians, of course, just the happiest. So they were yeah. so happy to be in America and not out of the war. And we tried to get these people back to Germany, and they didn't want to go. Well, that's true. <laughs> they were, had it so good, yeah. Uh, so after I spent that summer on at the at the, at the Zugspitzer Mountain, we, we skied up until the middle of July. We had a foot of snow there on July the 4th, I remember. And in August, I was given two weeks leave and took a trip to Paris and England and Scotland. And through, this was run through the American Express. And then uh, we, I was due for discharge. We, my time was up. And in September, I was sent home. We went to Bremerhaven. Mac Reynolds and myself were still he was stationed close by, and we we went up to the <coughs> casual officer replacement in Bremerhaven, and then uh, we were on a liberty ship on our way home. Liberty ship, <laughs> all beat up, hadn't hadn't had any paint since since it was built. Takes our kind of victory, and. Uh, we had a nice weather going home. It was a nice, pleasant trip. And let's see, I think I... Did you sleep in a hammock? 
No, I think I got bunk still. The, the, the officers were sleeping in bunks. I, mean, the, uh, I, I, I think this picture was taken as we drew into port. Both of these ships were, pictures were taken as we came into New York Harbor. And they still had a lot of whistles and band playing and everything. <laughs> this was in uh, a year after the war was over, but they still gave a gave us a good reception. And I went down to Fort Bragg's discharge. Whack, the discharge officer, was upset because I hadn't been promoted. Really? <laughs> she says, it. you should go home as a captain. He says, if you'll stay here five more days, I'll get you promoted. I said, no, thank you. <laughs> she asked me, I, I had a reserve commission. She said, uh, wouldn't you like to stay in the reserves? I said, no, thank you. <laughs> but it was really the most pleasant two years I've ever had in my life. I, I was doing work that mainly that I was trained to do, except for this little period of few months there when I was learning how to do little orthopedics there in the ski school. But it was uh, after my internship at Grady Hospital, which was the hardest work I've ever done, to have the easiest two years of my life and being paid for it. First time I was able to afford to buy a car or able to uh, had any money to spend. So it was great for me. Do you recall Pearl Harbor at yes, 47 to 41? Yes, I was, uh, at that time I was rooming with a, another fellow. I, I'd started, we broke, broke, we spent our three first year together, Charlie Holman and Dr. Stegman and I, as freshmen there, but I started out my sophomore year as house manager of our fraternity house. And after about a month of that, I found that I couldn't keep my studies up. <laughs> so I moved in with a friend at the dormitory, and I was I remember that Sunday when I was in the dormitory room studying, and we heard about Pearl Harbor, and we, of course, when after the war started in '39, we everybody had the feeling it was just a matter of time, and so the time came. But it really didn't affect us, and we were the only way it affected us. We <clears throat> cut our, out our summer vacations. We went on what they call accelerated program. We uh, went summer and fall straight through, and then and then we went into specialized training program the last nine months. But uh, <clears throat> otherwise, we, we it didn't affect us. We were so busy with our studies and the work that. We didn't have much time to think about anything else. If I might ask, where had you grown up and where were you from before? Well, I'm a, I'm a native Athenian. And Went to the University of Georgia pre-med and then Emory Medical School. And where was your home in Athens? Before? It was on Daring Street. And did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had a brother who was, I should talk about how, because he was had finished law school and just started his practice of law. He did not take advanced ROTC, he had no commission, and he was drafted early on. And was <clears throat> sent, he was an enlisted man in the Air Corps and was sent down to Florida with, I think, maybe the 49th Pursuit Group. And uh, when Pearl Harbor came, I think the next day they received orders to go to Australia, and they were packed up and left within about three weeks, and their planes were crated up, and they flew the Panama Canal to Australia, and they were the first uh, airplane pursuit squadron to get to Australia after the war started. And he was overseas for 33 months, <clears throat> and. Uh, when they took New Guinea, his unit was stationed in New Guinea, and I think he was there for almost two years, but <clears throat> he was went to officer candidate school in Australia, and the man in charge of the officer candidate school was our next door neighbor and on Daring Street, Ernest Lee Griggs, who <laughs> was right was in charge of the officer candidate school there. 
And Howell came home the day I left for, to go on active duty. We, we were together one day. He was been overseas for 33 months, and he came home in about the first week in October of 44, and that's and we saw each other one day when I left for Chicago to go on active duty. And he <clears throat> married the next week his childhood sweetheart, and they, they stayed in the Air I think, one more year before he was discharged and started back in Athens to practice law, but he was ill his past 10 years of his life. He had a vague, an unusual neurological disease. He was paralyzed from the waist down almost. And uh, no one ever diagnosed the disease. He went to Emory and Duke and nobody could ever pin a diagnosis and he finally died bedridden and uh, around 1980 and we think that he probably picked up uh, maybe a slow virus in New Guinea but uh, he, he had 33 years overseas duty during the war and <laughs> the uh, part in New Guinea was really horrible living it was even though he was with Air Corps and they lived a lot better than than the infantry. The Navy had the best deal as far as food and quarters and then the Air Corps was pretty well treated and then the combat infantry had the poorest quarters and poorest living conditions. And, but uh, he, did, he did live under very primitive conditions for, for about a year and a half or so in New Guinea. Could you send correspondence to your family uh, in those years? Could you write? Um, and was was your mail censored? Well, of course, I was not over until after the war was over. But Howell's mail was censored, and we we could we, the correspondence was pretty good. That's something that Army tried to do was keep the mail going because it meant a lot to the men overseas. So. They, they made a real effort to, uh, and they would forward that mail to you. You'd be transferred two or three places, and that mail would catch up to you most of the time. So the, the, the mail service was good during the war. Um, can you give me a hint of, of if, you, must, you must have been so busy in Atlanta in those years. 16 hours a day, you may not have seen much of Atlanta. No, we did. We did. <laughs> That's about all we saw was the hospital. Right. During our first year of medical school, it was not well. It was real hard work. That first year, they made it extremely hard and difficult. But uh, we did have one day, we, Saturday afternoon and Sunday, we always had time to do things and went to football games. We, and and. One thing that was, was it 41, I guess, Georgia played some of its home games in Atlanta because the transportation difficulties instead of it was much easier to, people couldn't spend their ponds riding to Athens, from Atlanta to Athens. So the game I guess we remember best is the Alabama game when uh, Grant, Field, yeah. Grant Field and Alabama was head 10 to nothing at the half and then Sinkwich and Poshnik. Right, three kind of, passes. I think we beat Alabama 20 or 21 to 10. I scored in the second half, and that was when I went to the Rose. That was Rose Bowl yeah. team, I think. <clears throat> but we did, were able to that in 40 and 41. We saw most of the Georgia football games. But after the after Pearl Harbor, it was a different story and. <clears throat> Transportation was no good, and I, I had no transportation anyway. <laughs> I couldn't afford a car. <laughs> so it was all work and study from Pearl Harbor on. It was an accelerated program. We, we, we went no summer vacations, and uh, the work was very, very difficult. And I think all we thought about was next day just trying to finish our work and 
get to bed and get some rest so we can get up and go through another day. So you might come back to your room and find somebody else is in your bed already. Uh -huh. <laughs> Musical beds. The interns and the residents would have to get up and when they'd go back to bed it'd be full of one of the students or something. <laughs> The, the students, we, we, we had a res quarters in the top floor of Color Grady Hospital that was colored in white at that time and of course there was no air conditioning and, uh, and the I remember the, the soot was horrible mm -hmm. there. The windows would open if you want fresh air, the soot would blow in down in the middle of old Atlanta. And uh, the students would have to help out at night and they didn't have a bed to sleep in so they, they would sometimes they would come sleep in the, our interns bed and people would just kind of sleep where they could. Get a few weeks before they do ride yeah. it out of the bed. <laughs> I've also been interested as I speak to people about the World War II era to hear about the depression and the, the years that preceded our entry into World War II. Um, is there anything you can give me a hint of those years in Athens? Um, well, I think everybody was in the same boat. Nobody had money. <laughs> Very few people had, our age had cars. And, uh, Fortunately, had, the food was cheap. So, the watermelon for 10 cents. <laughs> so I, since when you're all in the same boat, you don't think about it. Everybody just thought that's the way things are. And, but uh, when you think about all the kids, when they get 16, everybody gets a car, and I was, I didn't have a car till I finished medical school. I used to have to ride the street cars in Atlanta. I have to go on a date, I'd ride a street car. And the girls I was dating went out in Decatur, I'd have to <laughs> meet them downtown, go to a picture show, and maybe eat, and then get on a street car and ride to Decatur. <laughs> and then try to six miles for a nickel. Then I have to not sure what time the streetcars left. You had to get back time to catch the streetcar back before they quit running. So it was that, that's the way life was. So what did you gentlemen think of Franklin Delano Roosevelt fifty years ago? Well, he was a hero to me. Mm -hmm. I was. I was not a, much politically either way, but I just love Franklin D. Roosevelt as a man. My father was a lawyer and he was a Democrat. He was always chairman of the executive committee of the 10th district and he was for Roosevelt until he tried to pack the Supreme Court. <laughs> and after that, there was nobody worse than Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> he was the middle of the line sort of a guy. No, he uh -uh. Top of the bottom. <laughs> um, and Harry Truman, did you guys feel one way or the other about him? Did did you know who he was when Roosevelt died? Oh yeah, we knew it just casually knew he was a senator and just a plain sto spoken man. I, I had a lot of respect for him. I think he's a good man. I, I think everybody had respect for Truman because he was decisive and and. Uh, I don't think he had any haters like No, and, and, and he, he was straightforward. Roosevelt was devious, even with his own friends. You, he, you never knew when he would put a knife in your back. That's, that's pretty that's common knowledge. That's no, that's, I think anybody, you read anybody, and the people that, uh, <clears throat> when he didn't have any use for you, well, he would, that was it. I don't, I don't think there's any, uh, I don't think anybody that is, talks about his politics that he was, he would use people and uh, then let them go. I often move on from asking about those political leaders to asking about generals and commanding officers and such. As doctors, you guys saw another side of of things. Dr. Irwin, uh, you told me you were at some point in 94 or 5, was it? Was it when I was in Germany? Yes. I'm that interested. was in 1946. 1946, The war right. had been over 
almost a year. Um, I was assigned to the Third Army. General Patton had already been killed. He was in command of the Third Army, and he had been in charge of the Third Army, which the Third Army had occupation duty down in Bavaria, the southern part of uh, of the. Uh, I don't know where they, where there might have been another area, but he he was the Third Army headquarters was in Augsburg, as I remember. And I think General Truscott was had taken over Third Army. But of course, during the occupation time, you, it was nothing like war. It was just the opposite. The Germans, you it was you really lived high. You. You could buy anything you wanted to for a candy bar or cigarettes, and there's trading in the black market. I expect at least a lot of the GIs had been joined military government, and and almost all of them were living with a German girlfriend. And the uh, I expect there was early on there was no, supposed to be no fraternization. Now, I think anybody had been in combat wouldn't have anything to do with the Germans, but a lot of the People that came in later on or had been in service troops, and the Germans, they fraternized, and uh, most of them, uh, most of the, that group, uh, all had German girlfriends, and uh, and the black market was rampant. You could buy all kind of things, uh, silver, china. A lot, a lot of people were packing up all kind of <coughs> things and sending them home. And uh, you asked about uh, commanding officers. Yes, uh, indeed. During World War II, my commanding officer was a man named Shamboro, Colonel Shamboro. Uh, I noticed in the newspapers that he was head of the whole, he was the Surgeon General of the Army uh, during the Korean War. He was the only one of any distinction that I can remember in my outfits. Where did you work with him, work under him? or? Then it's at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. Army Medical Department schools. Good little bench of the ones in Carlisle. They had switched the school down to San Antonio when I got into the Army. And uh, so we, I, I went through that school under Colonel Shambora. He became, he was general by the Korean War. and was head of the whole outfit. Did the surgeon, the surgeon general's office, had, was that in existence in, in those days as well, but before Korea, uh, was that in existence during that's the World a public, War II? That's a public health office, and that has nothing to do with the Army. Right. So, but, but cabinet, yeah, cabinet post? Was, did Roosevelt it, have a surgeon general? Mm, but it wasn't a cabinet post at that cabinet, time. Was, yeah. That was the, he was head of the public health service, and yeah. I get, didn't bought to have an internship in the public health service. I think it did. It did, yeah. Dr. Trailer, his brother-in-law, had an internship in the public health hospital. That was an entirely different setup, and uh, there wasn't, the Surgeon General didn't have the authority or the standing they have now. It was, but my the medical corps in general, we we didn't have much military discipline. We, as long as we did our work, and and once a week uh, at. That's, and when I was at this Camp Walton, Texas, we had a formation. We had a line up in, in a platoons, and we had platoon sergeants, and we might drill for half an hour. And but we were supposed to. That was our. Other than that, we ran a hospital just like we in any other hospital. We. You. Uh, the only thing new was the medical corpsmen that they had in the hospitals that we didn't have in the general hospital in the hospitals and they were always a big help they were always well trained and did a good job and uh, and relieved the nurses of a lot of duties that trivial duties did they come from the ranks they were trained in any of those and the corpsmen did you? Is that part of your? No, he, he I taught, taught. I taught at that school, but we taught the other officers. Uh huh. I didn't really do much teaching. I mean, it's just a assignment that they. I didn't, I didn't have any particular qualification for it, but they they did it by the number, I guess. They got got my number, and so I taught 
and uh, I'm not good Lord. Most fun I had the whole time up until that time was being in the service and getting that getting that big paycheck every month, being able to go around and do things on your own. So uh, we didn't, good Lord, know I either one had a very tough time of it in the service. I understand that the medical profession was very different then, but after your time in the service, were things a little harder again? Well, I had to go back to a residency, and, but it was a kind of a, I don't know, it was a sort of a happy coming home kind well, of Well, the, the difference was we went to a residency, a page or something. Yeah, we, we, right. When we went into service, we coming back to Grady Hospital, a $30 yeah. a month residency, but the VA started a training program connected with the medical schools, and he went to Lawson, which was connected with Emory, and I went out to Salt Lake City. I'd learned to ski, and I decided I'd go somewhere where I could ski some more. And I went to the Salt Lake VA Hospital, which was connected with the University of Utah. And we were paid $120 a month. I think. Man, <laughs> and we, we were expecting to get $30 a month. So we, we were, I bought a car and, and uh, got married. and. Started a family. <laughs> How many children do you have, sir? I have four. Five and five grandchildren, and he's got two children, and I have four, four, grandchildren. four grandchildren. And your wife's maiden names? Trying Janet to get all LA this information was, yeah. in there. Janet L.A. was my wife's maiden name. My wife is Patricia Graham. She was from California. She had done recreation work in Alaska at Mount McKinley, and then after the war was in Europe, she uh, came back to California and applied for the Red Cross. And they didn't take her, and that they did get her. She did Army Special Services recreation work in uh, Mount McKinley, and she got a similar job in Europe and went over to Europe in uh, November of 1945 and stayed for two years. Doing I had a real good time over there. You mentioned family. <clears throat> a good person for you to interview would be my sister Marion, my younger sister, who was in the WASPs, mm -hmm. Women's Air, Air Force Service Pilots, and uh, they flew during the war, flew all over the country, took took training bombers to the embarkation sites, and then the men would take them from there and take them on overseas. But she had some experiences. Is she living nearby? She's she's down in Texas. Ah. Um. Well, she might come, come to visit us before too long. Um, if she does, I'd be, I'd like to do that. Good. Um, I guess we may be running near. Uh, I mean, I'm. I usually let these go as long as they would, but. Um, I'll tell you one experience with the Nuremberg trial. You know, Bob Stevens was there, was there at Nuremberg, and I think it must have been in June of '46. The the whole court came up to my, it was a resort where I was stationed in, in Garmish, and uh, they all came up to the Schneefener House Hotel where, it's a beautiful hotel on the side of a mountain, and uh, all the Russian judge and the English, French, American judge were all, all came up with our associates and to see the scenery from up there. and. They sent two, they must have been 10-gallon jugs of, uh, let's see, not an old-fashioned, what is it, gin and, gin and vermouth? Martini. Martini. <laughs> they must have sent 20 gallons of martini up there to serve these distinguished guests. And we served them a meal and served them martini. I think they skimmed the top of one jug. <laughs> the rest rest of it was left over up there for our disposal. <laughs> I, I got a, I had a picture made of the group and I gave it to Bob because it got a picture of Judge Jackson and all of his. But Bob it didn't come on that little expedition. It was, I guess, maybe 60 miles. We were stationed maybe a little further, 80 miles from Nuremberg. Now he mentioned that he had talked 
both before the outbreak of, of war. That's right. Um, did you know that he was serving with the Nuremberg? Um, yes, Bob's, at that point? Bob's family and my family have been close friends. His mother and my mother at one time were raised in the same house. His, I guess his mother's mother died early on and uh, my grandfather and his gran grandfather were working with the, in the state prison commission. One was administrator and, and my grandfather was kind of executive secretary. So I think when his mo grandmother died, the families moved in one house together. So our families have been close friends for, for many years and I knew Bob when he was here at the university before he started teaching and family families have always been close friends so I did not I don't guess I knew that he was at Nuremberg I would probably have gotten tried to get him. Before Nuremberg you were going to school. But of course. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I think but, I understand the chronology. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you something else about Goodloe and his family. Goodloe's great-grandfather was the first president of the Confederate Congress before Jefferson Davis took the presidency of the, of the uh, Confederacy. And Bob Stevens is the great-grandson, uh, great-grandson of the brother. No. Yeah. Is that right? Great -grandson right, of the brother, brother. Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy. So between Goodloe and Bob, we got two real great but they, they were not good friends. They were political enemies. That's right. Bob Howard Cobb and uh, Alexander Stevens were. In fact, I just ran across something recently. Uh, when Cobb's Legion was formed, uh, Howard Cobb's brother-in-law, Luther Judson Glenn, formed a company in Cobb's Legion and called it the Stevens Rifles. And Mrs. Howell Carr was very upset, and I don't think she ever spoke to, to <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Glenn again. <laughs> Howell was the hawk, and uh, Bob was the dove. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Stegeman, I, I, I understand that your name has been around the university for a while. Are you related to that? Yeah, that's, that's my family. My father's who the Stegman Hall was named after. He was director of athletics and, and the dean of men at the university for a number of years. And and where was your home in those days? Right here. On which, was, which neighborhood? On what street? Well, we're now we're on Greenbrier Court, which is near the Beechwood Shopping Center. But you lived on lived on Lumpkin where Street. Did you grow up? Well, my, my, where I grew, grew up was on Lumpkin Street. Right. It's a big house on Lumpkin Street that's been torn down now. We had a one house before that was on Springdale too. Um, but he, he was about two blocks from Five Points. Um, where did you both live during your college years? Were you in the fraternity house for some? That wasn't that wasn't your experience. I was. We were in the same fraternity, but I, uh, I never did. I had my family at home, and mm -hmm. so I spent most of my time at home. And then I was in the football dormitory for. Uh, three years. You know, between the football dormitory and home, I... This is Dr. Stegman when he was a boy. Let me zoom in on that. <laughs> Let me zoom in on that. I'm getting it. How were we then? Fifth, sixteen? I think it was out the golf course right at the, the university. Out, out at the Athens Country Club. Oh, yeah. James Payne, my brother. Is that how? Mm-hmm, that's how. <laughs> Jack Reed and Jimmy Hudson. Is that the Y camp? No, this was down the Legion Pool. We were. Oh, that looks like a Y camp. Mm. Oh, that's Athens Y camp. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's Lake Burton. Used to take a canoe trip up there. Yeah. That's Burton down there. Charlie Heflin. When did you both move back to Athens? Where are you living now, Dr. Irwin? <clears throat> I live on Millet Circle. He's about two blocks from the Five Points, too. We, uh, 
I moved back in August of 1948. And he, he, when did you come in January? January 1st, 1947. No, 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 no. When I came here, it was 49. 49. 49. January 1st, 49. And we practiced together until he retired. What year did you retire? 1980. 1980, and I retired in 1987. Where was your office? We were first down on uh, Hancock at... Professional this building? Professional building. Is that this? Is, that, is, that is it still, still there? I think it is. I haven't been by that in a long time. It's across from the Methodist Church down below below the post office, and then in 1950 they built the medical center out at the corner of Chase Street yeah, and Prince ten, Avenue, 1010 ten, ten Prince, Prince Avenue. Avenue, we moved out there. I know the professional building well. Exploration Resources just moved out of it. Um, is there anything I haven't hit, I'm sure there is, um, that, um, from, especially from the World War II era, um, are there people or characters who stand out in your memory from those years? I'm going to let go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anatomy professor was a name, a man named Blingo. They call him, we call him the Butch. And he was a uh, just reminiscing with Goodlow about a our anatomy teacher over at Emory University Medical School was named Dr. Blinko. We call everybody called him the Butch. And he was a real trooper, martinet type of fella. Was a uh, and whether or not we passed the flunk was entirely up to him. <laughs> he passed who he wanted to, and he flunked out who he wanted to. He was he was really the in charge of the freshman class. <clears throat> We were all scared to death of it, but once we got through, we were pretty well educated in anatomy. We spent the whole year on the, on the human body, dissecting the human body. That, that sounds pretty fearsome uh, for him to have that kind of power over you at Emory Med School. Yeah, right. During our freshman year, once we got out from under, he was very docile and friendly, <laughs> but he wasn't much at the <laughs> before that. Um, well, um, I'll go on and ask my, my last question, the same, same I asked um, Mr. and Mrs. Stevens. I, I tend to ask for a su summing up by, by asking you to think of talking to younger people about those times. If you were speaking to people who knew of a previous generation's experience through books or videos like, like this one, is there something from your experience that either stands out or seems most important to you? That's kind of hard. You, know, you don't have to. <laughs> you can take it in a piece. Is, it, is there a, or I could toss it to Dr. Irwin and bring it back. I was going to say one, one thing that I do recall a lot and still dream about was, was the association with the, our head football coach, Wallace Butts. Uh -huh. He was a tremendous character and uh, just full of good humor, but he was just mean as he could be, too. And uh, you either loved him or you hated him. I was one that loved him just to death, because he was just a, I thought, a wonderful person. But he, was a, he put us through that see, our senior year. It was his first year of head coaching, and he really put us through the conditioning part of it. So by, by the time I got to Emory, I was pretty well in pretty good shape. And then we ran into Butch Blinko over in Emory. So back to back, I had two of the hardest fellows in the world teaching me. <laughs> then we had Dr. Stead, who was just as hard. <laughs> the well, was professor subject? of medicine. Oh. And that was what we, we both uh, studied under him, and he selected us to intern under him. So we were in his favor, but uh, he was another very strict, very demanding person and uh, highly respected. And he, uh, one of the, he was such a demanding and such a fierce-looking person that one of the medical students was presenting <laughs> a case, and he was 
fainted just being in his presence. <laughs> you were just scared to death. <laughs> Interning under him, were you working in, in Emory or in Grady? In Grady. At Grady. At Grady Hospital, colored and white. We would rotate one side, the other side, and that was in the days when they had the colored and white Grady Hospital. One right across the street from the other one. Oh my gosh. An underground tunnel between the two. We spent half the time in that tunnel going back and forth. Going back and forth. The blood bank was on one side, the white side. We have to run over there to cross Matt's blood and run back. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, he was in charge of our intern program, and, uh, and he was very demanding. And the girl I was dating at that time lived in the kid and not far from Dr. Stead. Occasionally, we would try to slip up and get somebody to take calls and have a date. And one Saturday night, I, <laughs> I was supposed to be on call, and I got off the street call with my date, and there was Dr. Stead. <laughs> on the street call. And that was the worst thing you could do, was yeah. take off when you're supposed to be on duty. Did he say anything to you tonight? Never at the did he anything at the time, but I know <laughs> I had a little mark in my book. <laughs> How many demerits you think that was? Uh -huh. <laughs> My wife Janet was his uh, technician. On, at uh, they, they had a special research group called the Shock Team, and he was ahead of it. And uh, my wife was that that technologist. It was a great experience for her. That Shock Team was sponsored by the War Department. It was to study the cases of blood loss that occurred in the great in the in the emergency room. They had facilities there, some of the first in the country to uh, put the catheters in the arm to catheterize the heart, to get pressures in the heart. And this is, this procedure of cardiac catheterization was invented in Germany and then they had a unit at Bellevue and this was the second unit in the United States, was at Grady Hospital under Dr. Stead. While we were there, it came, it was organized there. And uh, Janet was one of his technologist technicians there to help. They would somebody would come in the middle of the night bleeding heavily and they would everybody would be called in to to get the pressures inside the heart and the lungs and do blood oxygens and see how they responded to treatment. This was research effort sponsored by the War Department because of the to uh, help them treat blood loss in battle. This was a, Shock from burns and that kind of thing, too. Shock and burns and I know. So most of those things, those night where the blue face, and so Janet, who was on call 24 hours a day, would have to get up at 2 or 3 a.m. when they called the team in to, to study these shock cases. And uh, she'd stand out there on the Moreland Avenue, wait for the streetcar right in the middle of the night. It couldn't last five minutes today. <laughs> and she had to walk through from Edgewood, Auburn Avenue to Grady. Oh, I'm through it all. Downtown. Downtown. Midtown. Overnight. But nobody ever threatened us. He, uh -uh. he got through all right. And, and where were you living um, in those years? I mean, well, at that time we were living over on, on uh, Moreland Avenue where, near Ponce de Leon. Near, you know where Briarcliff comes sure into Ponce de Leon? And then Moreland is, a, is an extension of Briarcliff on the other side. You, you're going down Briarcliff. Across uh, Ponce de Lee, and then you're on Moreland Avenue. And we were about, I think we were the first house on the first apartment house on the left on Moreland there. We got that because it was sort of halfway between Emory and, and Grady Hospital. So we could go either way from that, from that intersection. <clears throat> we had our 50th class reunion last year, and Dr. Stead came. And uh, we all remember this very fierce, demanding creature. And uh, he was in tears several times. Was he really? <laughs> oh, yes. He was very moved. But he was still alive last He's year. He was still alive. He was, a, he was only 33 when he was made professor and head of the department. So and we were his first whole cl crew that he, he came back about the year we became junior medical students. So we were his first class that he trained in medical school and in the hospital. So I think he felt a 
little closer to us. Or, yeah. But yeah. everybody was surprised that uh, we were starting telling stories about old times. And, and, uh, he took up, huh? And I told him about I, the training I had was so superior to the other men that I yeah. was with at the, at the, the station hospitals and VA hospitals. And I told him that my training was superior to anything that I, other people that I, my peers at the different hospitals I came to later on, and he was very moved by that, and he was in tears several times during the evening, so. But uh, he's 10 years older than we are, I think he's, he's close to 85 now. 85, good man. Yeah, I saw his pictures on the, that you brought back. They look, look like he's pretty healthy. Well, he is. Dr. Irwin, is there something you think is most important from that experience? I just, from the medical point of view, I think uh, John and I had the, the best time to practice medicine. When we started at Grady, there was no such thing as antibiotics. Uh, I remember the first patient we treated with penicillin in Grady was a 13-year-old girl with a tonsillitis and peritonsil abscess. It was closing in. She was, couldn't breathe. Was, this is what joy killed George Washington. And uh, we called Boston and they sent us down penicillin in very small doses. 5,000 units. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the first time penicillin was used in the South. Did she get well? Yeah, she did. And, uh, but we came in with the era of antibiotics and all these advances and heart surgery and everything else, and we were able to practice medicine during this time. And now the government is directing doctors what to do and what not to do, and we are glad. We got out at the right time. We, we were very lucky to practice in a really golden age of medicine. But I, I think that when you think about our lives, there's, there's no way that I could have anticipated 10 years down the line what that life would be like, oh. much less 30 years from down the line. We, everything is, so many things unanticipated and you, nobody anticipates come along, so you just have to learn to appreciate the good things and roll, roll with the bad things. <laughs> Is there anything you care to add about the World War II era or Athens or, or anything at all? Dr. Stegeman, Dr. Irwin, either of you. Well, thank you. Sorry, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> I think we were just so busy doing our job that that was that what the wall was to us. We were just working, working extremely hard most of the time. I'm glad guys like you were working as hard as you were working. I, I, I'm sorry it took so long, but uh, 